Well, Tim the Toolman Taylor used to say it this way. Heidi ho, good neighbor. Let me take a cup of coffee here. Take a little bit of a swig. I've had a, a little bit of sinus stuff going on and some uh, throat issues, some voice issues. I blew some vocal cords a few weeks ago and still have not quite recovered. So I kind of have to coat them down. I hope you don't mind, but welcome to Last Day's Awakening. I'm Jimmy. We are in some wild and crazy time. All right. I grew up in cattle country in north central Nebraska, in the sand hills of Nebraska, and uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, on on different ranches. Um, I was not a rancher, not a cowboy, but I did participate in a rodeo once and tried to ride a cow. I can tell you I was not successful at riding that cow. We had a bull rope that tied that bull rope around the cow, which doesn't work the same as a bull, but it's still, you tie that rope around, and I tied it around my fingers and beat that, just like the old bull riders do. And that cow took out of there, and I flew. Kind of had my own little mini raptor. But I think of that, I think of that happening in my life when I was 18 years old, almost 60 years later, but pardon me, 50 years later, I'm not that old, almost 50 years later, 47 years later. And I think, man, we are riding it now. We are riding the bull right now. This world is rocking. It is rocking. I've got a list of things again. I'm kind of starting out this way lately, just telling you, sharing with you things that you probably already know. Um, but just just to show you the list of things that have been happening in the last list, just the last couple of weeks. First of all, what's going on with Israel? Israel attacked the Iranian ambassador's residence, which is connected to the Iranian, Iranian, however you say it, embassy, the Persian embassy. Can I say it that way? Uh, attacked the quarters, and this was in Damascus. All right. Wow. Uh, where do we know? What, what do we know about Damascus, guys? What do we know? Uh, we know that. Isaiah 17 at some point is going to come into play. When? Don't know. But it's certainly heating up. But anyway, uh, several handful of top Iranian operatives that were leading some of the um, uh, Al-Quds uh, terrorist group and, and working with Hezbollah in Lebanon, they were killed. So they were assassinated. First time really Israel has gone after something so important as a an ambassador's residence, the ambassador very easily could have been killed. So, yes, you know things began to heat up immediately with Iran, and they have said they're going to retaliate, and they're going to retaliate big time. So, wow, things are really wild and crazy. You have continuing action in the Ukrainian and Russian war. It's actually an upswing in the war of uh, drone attacks, drone attacks, missile attacks, uh, UAVs, of course, um, attacks on drone factories. Wow. And, and deep within Russia, attacks taking place. Russia is not going to stand for it. You know this. And uh, we just seem to be continuing to poke the bear and, and doing everything we can to provoke the bear. Uh, the bear is not innocent. That is not my point. The point is, okay, Putin's a good guy and everybody else is bad. That's not my point. My point is, you poke a bear, and the bear is eventually going to react in a pretty massive way. Uh, Taiwan, did you notice that Taiwan, yesterday evening, our time, had a 7.5 earthquake? I watched several videos of the building shaking, landslides, uh, buildings uh, off their foundations, toppling, bridges swaying, people in cars and buses, on bridges, rocking, amazing. And then, of course, the tsunami warnings were out for Taiwan and Japan. Taiwan did have a tsunami. I don't know what the um, results of that were. I watched two or three videos. It was a pretty decent, decent sized. No, no tsunami is decent, but <laughs> you know what I mean. It was a sizable tsunami with vehicles being swept away, buildings being swept away. And crazy people out with their 
selfie sticks taking selfies as the tsunami's coming and and they're taking a selfie as the tsunami is carrying them inland uh, you know this world has been hit with a stupid stick and it's it's across the board we're we're talking about chaos we're talking about chaotic thinking reprobate mind in action we're we're talking about stupidity foolishness all around the world this last weekend, of course, we celebrated we celebrated uh, the Resurrection Day on Sunday. I don't believe it was the true Resurrection Day, but we celebrated it anyway because the rest of the world, you know, at least the, the calendar, has uh, that as the, the day. <laughs> so we celebrated it. You say, well, why, Pastor Jimmy, did you do that if it's not the real day? Because the rest of the world is celebrating it, and quite honestly, it's one of two Sundays where people will go to church that do not generally go to church, so it's an opportunity to share the gospel, and I did. I shared the gospel. Uh, I watched I watched some pretty hardened people listen to the gospel and remain hardened, which I think they got even harder, but still, you got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would have liked to have seen the results of the people believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing him as Lord. Uh, and I'm hoping that that is happening in their hearts as a result of what was shared, what was preached on Sunday. But the fact is, uh, we celebrated it that day while March 31st has already been named. It wasn't that Joseph Biden named March 31st as you know, that day that for that weekend. March 31st was already named as the day of transgender visibility. It just so happened that March 31st this year landed on the day that we celebrated the resurrection. Of course, it was a great affront. It was a massive affront to Christianity. And, um, and then he turned around and banned any type of Christian symbols or references in their Easter egg hunt. <laughs> <laughs> that all drives me crazy anyway, but uh, an affront, an affront to God, an affront to believers, an affront to Christians. Uh, of course, yeah, because we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did I get all mad and crazy? No, I didn't. I, you got to look at it this way these, in these days, that we're under persecution. We are under persecution in the Western world. Am I under persecution here? No, where I live, not necessarily under persecution, but the way that city councils, school boards, um, local governments are all functioning under this drop-down theory, this trickle-down theory of godlessness. And so, yes, it is affecting us everywhere, but uh, openly coming against Christianity, this is persecution. This is persecution. We're under it, and I think the longer that we are here, it is going to, of course, get worse, and uh, and we should fully expect to come under more and more persecution, even to the point of suffering in some cases, in many cases, possibly. Uh, you're going to see it. You, you are going to see it as long as we are here. So you had the transgender day of visibility, this abomination that took place. I took it as a... Um, kind of as a badge of honor to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and just, you know, let them do what they're going to do. The Bible says the world's going to do what it's going to do. Let the wicked be wicked. Let the righteous live righteously. We're, we're, we're doing that. The world, One World Trade Center, of course, by the governor of New York. What a dim wit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was unchristian. That was unchristlike. What a whitewashed sepulcher. <laughs> That's what Jesus would have said. Mm. The One World Trade Center was lit up in the rainbow covers colors. Pardon me. Uh, the wrong rainbow colors. We know this, guys. We know that. I don't, you know, you don't even need to comment. Oh, Pastor Jimmy, there, there are one more color in that rainbow. Yeah, I know that. It, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. We know it's wrong. We know it's the wrong one, okay? The covenant that God gave to Noah was never again to destroy the earth by flood, but we know from the scripture that he's going to use fire, and it's going to get fiery, 
as we approach the very last day. Okay. Um, you had the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge destroyed last week by a container ship. I did mention a movie. What was it? Um, uh, leave, leave the, leave the Earth behind. Whatever it was that movie by um, Mr. Obama, Obama um, to produce the movie, and and I mentioned that it had the same scenario of a ship striking a bridge. I was wrong. I haven't seen the movie. I just going by hearsay, but a bridge collapsing is part of the movie, and a container vessel at the start of the movie is the whole point that there is a cyber attack going on. I think that vessel ran ashore. So forgive me for getting that wrong. I just don't watch that kind of stuff very often. Okay, so I didn't, I, you know, I should have checked that. I, it would have been a waste of time for me anyway to watch anything by Mr. Obama. Obama. Um, but not only did that bridge collapse, but we have had several other bridges since then in the United States of America, bridges that have been struck by a barge, uh, some sort of vessel, and uh, some collapsed, some were so damaged that they had to be taken out of use. And these are all in arteries. They're in, uh, in arteries. So there is an obvious attack going on against the infrastructure of our country to bring about a a, uh, if not a standstill, a tremendous slowdown in the delivery of uh, products. Um, the supply chain is being affected. So that's happening in the United States of America. Oh, by the way, panic, 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 urgent, 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 panic, urgent panic. We have one person in Texas who somehow contracted the avian flu which jumped from a chicken to a cow to a person. And so massive um, emergency conference was held in the White House yesterday to prepare for an epidemic of the avian flu. Here we go again. Here we go again. Oh, here's an interesting one. I don't know if you've seen this, but they have discovered, in fact, it was a, an amateur um, astronomer, I believe he's actually a teenager, was, uh, was using his telescope and, and taking pictures of the moon, huge blow-up pictures of the moon in, in concession as in, in this past full moon. It was the past full moon. What was that, last week, a week ago? Yeah. A little more than a week ago, the full moon took place, and he was taking pictures of the full moon. And in those pictures, it was coming out that the moon is actually turning red. Okay, because we saw we've always looked at the moon shall turn to blood, right? The sky shall be dark and the moon shall turn to blood. Oh, it's a blood moon, but what if it's not? What if it's not? The moon's turning to rust, the rust color. It is known uh, as hematite, which is iron oxide. And you say, well, wait a minute. For there to be rust, there needs to be moisture and there needs to be atmosphere of some sort. And a, a, a scientist from NASA actually got on and was responding to this. And it, it turns out that the solar winds that have been, you know, really increasing because of the sunspot activity, and it's in an 11-year cycle, uh, whenever the moon goes behind the Earth, the solar winds are actually pushing atmosphere, including the dust particles in our atmosphere. So for about an eight-day period of time, the moon is going through that. Um, when it's you know in, in its partial phases, it's still in that that uh, can I say it? The wake of these solar winds pushing atmosphere and uh, particles of iron oxide that go to the moon, go all the way out to the moon. So it's it's not like the moon's gaining atmosphere. It's just that it's pushing the necessary uh, atmospheric conditions in these solar winds that hit the moon. And 
it's uh, hematite. It's it's actually creating rust in huge chunks of the moon. So the moon eventually here is going to turn red, especially if the solar winds in increase. I found that fascinating, especially when you look at hematite. Hematite in the Greek means blood. Should I say that again? Hematite in the Greek means blood. What is in the blood? Iron oxide. What, what makes it red? Iron oxide. Even in the blood. So the scripture is true after all. And those poo-pooing the blood moons? Yeah, they do it. Oh, the blood moons don't mean anything. And many out there now, including in the Christian world, saying the eclipse doesn't mean anything. It's just a wonderful time to see God's glory. I agree that it is a wonderful time to see God's glory. But to step in and say it doesn't mean anything, we'll deal with that in just a moment. <laughs> However, the moon's turning to blood. The moon is turning to blood. Wow. Let's talk about um let, let's talk a, a little bit about the fact that mockers and scoffers are out in force. You, one of you guys might be listening now. Mocker and a scoffer. I'm I'm just getting uh many many mockers and scoffers. They, they they don't even give a good argument. They just scoff. I had one in the comment from last week. Pardon my sinus issue. And it was, it, was, it was really quite interesting in the comment because the person said, there, I read a story of a queen 2,000 years ago who wrote in her diary that she was awaiting the day of the rapture. Oh, wait a minute. I thought you guys said that there no, was no rapture in the early church. There was no rapture theology at all in the early church. But here's a queen who was a Christian who was talking about the rapture. She was expecting the rapture. So... The scoffers and mockers don't even get it right when they're mocking and scoffing. But this, this person, I'm assuming it was a man, but I don't know that. It might have been a woman, said, well, because that queen was looking for the rapture and it never happened. It, it, you guys are going to be waiting a, a really, really long time. And while I'm reading that, I'm thinking, you poor person, you poor, poor person. that You don't even understand Second Peter chapter 3, to talking about how how... The Lord is patient concerning his promises, but not like slack, like we would consider slackness or slowness, but he's, he's patient. He's long-suffering. He, he he's not willing that any should perish. But Peter also right there in that context says, in the last days, mockers and scoffers will come because they'll be saying this very thing. It's in that same chapter. And he's, they're going to say, you guys have been talking about this for 2,000 years. Why, by golly, there was a queen who was looking for the rapture way back there 2,000 years ago, and it never came. It's never going to come. It's never going to come. And by the way, my friend, you are fulfilling the Scripture as a scoffer and a mocker. And the Scripture says this day is going to come up on you like a thief in the night. Please wake up. Please wake up to your lack of logic. In fact, you shot your own arguments down by saying, oh, she was looking for the rapture. I thought that was invented in 1866 by poor John Darby. We blame poor John Darby for the creation of the theology of the rapture, when that's not true. Church fathers all the way back to Irenaeus. Irenaeus wrote extensively on the rapture, and that's... That's, uh, you know, within 100 years of, of John, less than 100 years of John the Revelator that Irenaeus wrote. And you've got several of them. I mean, goodness, you've got Ephraim the Syrian. You've got, you've got others. Not even going to go into it. So people don't do their research. They just jump in and scoff and mock because it just seems to be the order of the day. And those guys are on steroids right now. What is, what is it they're mocking? They're not mocking a day of the Lord coming. They're not mocking that, unless you're part of the maybe the Seven Mountain Movements, but we're not going to talk about those guys either. But they're mocking the pre-tribulational rapture. That's what's under attack. And anything that comes under attack like that, to me, just is proven this is what's going to happen. Okay, let's talk about uh, the eclipse for just a second. 
Do I think something's going to happen on that day? Well, I don't know. I, 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 I do not have the uh, prophetic gift, right? Not sure I want the prophetic gift. I, I, <laughs> I have the gift of common sense. This is one of the most uncommon experiences that the, the United, United States will ever experience. Um, and I'm not going to go into every detail because there are so many videos out there that are talking about this. But this eclipse, we saw that uh, NASA is firing three rockets up into the eclipse, and their, pardon me, their um, the reasoning is to is to study the atmospheric conditions in the middle of a of totality of an eclipse. So they they want to see what's happening. Uh, with the atmosphere, okay? But they named their rockets Apophis, the Egyptian, Egyptian god, okay? This is uh, pretty amazing. So they're, they're firing their uh, Apophises up in. At the same time, CERN is going to fire off their um, Hadron Collider and try to find um, more about dark matter, and of course, uh, the conspiracy theorists are theorizing they're trying to or open a portal. Well, I wouldn't put anything past them at all. I really wouldn't put anything past them at all. What better time to do it than in the middle of a, of a darkening that's taking place? Now, uh, there are several emergency warnings that have gone out. And um, you look at it, there, most of those warnings, when you read them, are for massive amounts of population, especially in Indiana. And the reason for this that is coming now, besides the conspiracies that are out there, not meaning that conspiracies aren't true, it, conspiracy is just somebody is conspiring to do something, okay? We're theorizing that that might be possible, that somebody's going to try to do something. Not my point. My point is the atmospheric conditions for totality along the path of totality of this eclipse right now pretty much have Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas in overcast skies. And so all the people who are going to travel to Texas to view this eclipse, it's going to be like we were right here in St. Joseph, Missouri in 2017, August 23rd, 2017. We were expecting to see the eclipse and there were there were thousands and thousands of visitors who came to St. Joseph and the surrounds here to view the eclipse because it went right over the top of us. I guess it was going this way. You can't see how I'm situated, so never mind. But it was overcast. I think I mentioned we were, we were building uh, our kid's house and uh, out on their little homestead farm, it's, and we had just gotten the deck up, and, and I was uh, framing walls. We were getting ready to stand up some walls and had several actually stood up, and it starts to get dark. So, But it's overcast. My plan was to take my little glasses and lay down on the deck of that house and watch the eclipse go right over my head. And what it was was overcast, and you could still see the effect of the eclipse you could see the black moon and the and the corona that was there so it was still slightly visible but all of the fun was taken out of it so what's going to happen all these people thousands upon thousands of people that were going to go to texas and oklahoma and arkansas uh now seem to be heading toward indiana and ohio where it is supposed to be clear uh, maybe partly cloudy in some spots, but mostly clear skies in those areas. So the mass majority of people are now going to be congregating in Indiana and Ohio. And in that corridor that goes up through um, up, upstate New York. Masses of people flocking together. Could that spell trouble? I don't know. It sure is a recipe for anybody who would want to attack. You know some of the um, astronomical things that are taking place. First of all, you have the alignment of planets at the same day, on the same day, April 8th. You have the Devil Comet that may be visible. It may be visible to the naked eye. It's going to be situated at about 10 o'clock, the 
10 o'clock position from the eclipse, and uh, Jupiter will probably be visible. And if the comet is visible, the Devil Comet, by the way, I uh, don't. Its official name was it Palm something or another. But devil Comet. Okay, let's call it the Devil Comet because it has two two horns, like a comet, or you know, like the devil, or like the dragon, the devil, the serpent. Okay, I don't know. If it's visible, you will see it visible as it appears to be chasing Jupiter. Oh my goodness! There's Revelation chapter twelve come into play where the dragon was before the woman as she was about to give birth so he could devour the child, but the man-child was caught up into heaven. Huh. Huh. Could it be? I don't know. Interestingly, I read this in somebody's article that on April 8th, we're talking about the anniversary I may have mentioned this in my last video, but I think it's worth talking about for a second again. The anniversary of Aleister Crowley and the visitation that he had by an entity that he later described as Satan. He had a different name in the meeting, but later on he has described him as being Lucifer himself, and uh, in which... He was given all the precepts over a three-day period of time for creating the movement that became the Church of Satan. And uh, on April the 8th, in that visitation, he was told to mark an X on the map over America. Okay, so I mentioned that to my wife. She says, well, does that mean the devil has foreknowledge? No, it doesn't mean the devil have, has foreknowledge, but remember there is... There was divine knowledge that was imparted before the flood in the form of the fallen angels. If you have read Enoch, there was different uh, knowledge streams that was knowledge of, of uh, the Elohim, not the Elohim, but the angelic host, and particularly the sons of God, the B'nai Ha Elohim. And they imparted this to men, how to make war, Arts of seduction, arts of black magic, etc., etc., metallurgy. Uh, di different knowledge streams were imparted. And so the divine knowledge, the knowledge of the angels, is such that they know how the galaxy works. They know the orbits. They know. So could he have predicted that far out? Yes, he could. Not prophetically, but scientifically, he could have. I don't know for sure, but it's interesting that that was the anniversary, and it's the anniversary of April 8th. I want to show you something else just, just, just for the sheer enjoyment of showing you something else. I'm going to see if I can blow this up just a little bit. I'm going to blow it up. All right. Uh, a little bit bigger. Hang on. I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. Okay, here we go. It's a little bit bigger. Um, I, I want you to notice. I, I want you to notice here. This is the the Tav and the and the Aleph. Okay, so you had the 2017 eclipse that traversed. Let me let me get a pin up here. It traversed from west to east and went right over us here in St. Joseph, Missouri. Here's my ex right there, okay? That's St. Joseph. Then came December of this year, an eclipse that also started in the northwest, made its way, if I can stay in the lines, I can't draw on the lines. No, I was never good at drawing in the lines. <laughs> anyway, it made its way uh, southeasterly, crossed Texas, crossed New Mexico, Utah, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the one that is coming up on April 8th starts way down here, way down here in Mazatlan, and makes its way in the northeasterly direction. The path of totality is right there. 
Uh, and it's it's wider than the 2017 eclipse, uh, twice as wide, actually, almost twice as wide. Yes, you know about going through the towns called Nineveh, you know all of that, you know all of that. But I want you to show you, wanted to show you, of course, we have the Tav. Let me let me change colors. This is this is the Tav that is formed by the two, the 2017 eclipse and of course the December 23 eclipse. So there's your Tav. Uh, not, pardon me, not the December 23, the 2024 eclipse. There's your Tav. The the December 20, December whatever day it was. Pardon me for getting it wrong. Um, that December eclipse forms the Aleph. But I want to show you something. I just just want to show you something here for just a second. All right. I'm going to erase this. And I'm going to put it back up there. It's not only the Tav right here. Okay. Not only the Tav. Um, put it up into a little, little thicker. This is your Tav. But I want you to notice, there's not only an Aleph, but there's two Tavs. There's two Tavs. I've been studying Hebrew quite a bit with uh, a group in my church, and it's been very interesting. We're studying words we're studying letters particularly the letters of uh the aleph bet the 22 letters uh particularly in regards to psalm uh 119 where each eight phrase or eight eight stanza uh grouping is after each letter of the aleph bet and um so we're studying the letters and it's interesting to me that whenever a letter shows or appears itself in rapid succession, you know, or, you know, double letters, then it, it actually doubles the meaning. Uh, mostly that comes in the form of the noon. The noon kind of looks like this. That's, that's a noon. And um, when you find two of them together, it kind of doubles the meaning. So in, in many cases, it's uh, uh, noon means life. Uh, it can mean fish. So it can mean multiple fish, but it can be abundant life. And so that's just kind of a thought there. And here we have two tabs. We have two, count them, two tabs that are appearing in, in these last two eclipses. The last three eclipses. 2017, 2024, and 2023. Tav and Tav. Tav means this. It means truth or a sign or a mark or it's a signature of life or death. And here we have two of them. Two of them. Count them. One. Uh, uh, uh. Two. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, some of you will really be offended that I use something from the Muppets. <laughs> but you have two of them. Two of them. Oh my goodness, two of them over the top. What am I saying? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. It's just interesting. The Tav, truth, sign or mark, life or death, the Tav. Of course, we know that the Tav is the symbol of the cross. There was life bought by the death of the one who went to the cross. And it shows the goodness of God on the one hand, but it also shows the judgment of God. On the other, how so? The goodness of God is that he, he sent his son to pay for our sin debt. He went to the cross. He shed his blood. He went to the top. 
He went to the cross. But he also has said that the cross being there, if it is not believed, if Jesus is not believed on, you're already under condemnation and you will be judged. So judgment will be coming. What does it mean for a nation? A nation will either repent or face judgment. And this especially becomes urgent when you're talking about the United States of America because the USA had its foundation upon the Judeo-Christian principles, was founded by those who wanted to express religious freedom. Yes, I know that there was Freemasonry mixed into all of that, but still, the nation was founded upon the biblical principles of the Christian uh, Judeo-Christian ethic, including the law. It was founded on that. It has had God's blessing upon it. It has been a, a conveyor, purveyor of the gospel to the nations for generations. And yet this nation is fulfilling everything to receive the judgment of the city Babylon. Is America mystery Babylon? Well, you're going to find arguments one way or the other. But I like, uh, I like one watchman said it this way. At least we're coming under the judgment, the same judgment of Babylon. And here we've been given the first, the first picture. The first picture was a repentance picture. And now, because repentance in our nation has not happened, could we be entering the moment of truth where the sign and the mark of life and death become double? It becomes double in power. I don't know, but I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I'm asking us to think about that. All right. Now, uh, let me get rid of that for just a second. I, I'm going to go uh, to a different place here, so you don't need to see all the navigation that I'm doing. Uh, but, but I'm going to go to the Scripture, because we are challenged in the Scripture by Jesus himself. And it's quite clear. For anybody who has eyes to see and ears to hear what he is saying, this is Luke chapter 21, verse 25. Luke, of course, and, and many watchmen, uh, Chuck Missler did, did some massive studies. M many watchmen have followed suit with the studies to show that the Gospels were written to certain groups of people. That's why there's slight differences in the Gospels. Even though they do not contradict, they're, they're said differently. Uh, certain sayings, certain things were, are, are written down differently. And Luke, of course, uh, being a Gentile, is writing from a Gentile perspective. He's writing to the Gentile church. So it is a message that is predominantly to the church during the church age. Mark is written from the juxtaposition of the tribulation period and the tribulation saints, people who will be going through the suffering of the tribulation and yet be saved. Matthew is written to the Jew with the idea that Jesus is king and he is coming to be the king of the Jews. So Luke to the church, Mark to the suffering saints during the tribulation, and Matthew to restored Israel. So we're talking Luke. What does Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 28 say? I'm going to read it from the New King James Version first. There will be signs in the sun. So in the sun, in the sun, in the sun. That means something in the sun. And, and we're seeing those signs, some, the, the massive eruptions and uh, the sunspots and, and all these things, we're seeing those in the sun. We're seeing signs in the moon, the moon turning to blood, remember? Uh, the rusting of the moon, the rusting of the moon, the moon actually turning to the color of iron oxide. Oh my goodness, it's more than blood moons. It's a bloody moon. And in the stars, signs. 
signs connecting all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. The, the sun, moon, and stars are giving for seasons, for signs, uh, for divine appointments, the moeds, the moedim, okay? And multiple studies on all of this. I'm not even going to rehash it all. But, and on the earth, so on the earth, there will be distress of nations. Would you say that we're in distress of nations right now where you have what's going on in Haiti, what's going on in South Africa, what's going on with, um, with tyrannical takeovers of Australia and New Zealand and Canada? Oh, my goodness. And, and they're in distress. The populations are starting to rumble at what's been taking place. In our own country, distress, divisions, racial divisions which I should requalify as being ethnically originating divisions. Okay, so it's the disturbation of the ethnic groups, one rising against the other, just exactly what Jesus said would happen when he said nation will rise against nation. That's the word ethnos against ethnos. Ethnic groups against ethnic groups. You're seeing it all over the place. You're seeing it in England. You're seeing, seeing it in France, you're seeing it in Germany, you're seeing it all over the place. Whether it is religiously oriented or whether it is ethnically oriented, which generally follows the same line, you have all of this disturbation happening right now on the earth. Distress of nations with perplexity. Everybody's saying, what in the world is going on? And you don't even have to be a believer. You don't even have to be a believer to see that people are looking at this eclipse and saying, what in the world is going on with this eclipse? It's only when you get these brainy theologians who say things like, don't follow the wackos. Don't follow the wacko Christians that say the end of the world is coming. Just look up and praise God at his great order. <laughs> Well, this is being ordered by God, for sure. But don't be a moron. We need to be looking up. And not that I'm calling these theologians morons. Please don't misunderstand me. But they're morons. A little bit of humor there. I pray for them that they'll wake up. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I think that's... The powers here goes directly to Ephesians chapter 6. It also goes to, uh, what is it, Hebrews chapter 9, or chapter 12, pardon me, chapter 12, and I mentioned it earlier, where everything in heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, including the powers. See, the powers of heaven, some of the powers and principalities that are still polluting heaven are going to be thrown down. They are going to be cast out. They're going to be cast to the earth. That happens in Revelation chapter 12, during the time of the tribulation. They still have to report to God, but eventually they're going to make war. Read Revelation chapter 12. They're going to make war in heaven, and Michael and his angels are going to throw them down, and they're finally going to lose their place in heaven. And uh, so you see the powers of the heavens are being shaken. Guys, it's happening. It's being shaken. Uh, I believe Satan has already thrown down the third of the angels to the earth. That's not a being cast out of heaven thrown down. That is, he has gone on the attack in an immense way. We're seeing demonic activity everywhere, including on videos like what happened with Pastor J.D. in his prophecy update last week, uh, a week ago. So it'd be, what is today? Wednesday. Uh, you know, so uh, 15, 16, 17 days ago when he was mentioning the rapture he's saying i'm not saying the rapture is going to happen and a woman manifests a demon they spent time casting that demon out you see the powers are being shaken when all that comes to its culmination verse 27 they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory now that's not the rapture that is the coming of the lord jesus christ so this stuff is going to increase in massive ways for the next seven plus years until they actually see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. We know from Matthew chapter 24, written to the Jews, that there's going to be in that moment a gathering. He's going to send his angels to the four winds. I did a study on this. Go back and find it three videos ago. 
where they're going to go to the four corners of the earth and gather together the elect. The elect in that chapter are the scattered Jews from around the world that are calling out Baruch HaBabashim. They're recognizing the sign of the Son of Man. They're calling out to their true Messiah, and he's going to bring them to Jerusalem. That is not the rapture of the church. Yeah, I know I'll get comments. You're a moron. Okay, you're, you're wrong. You're a deceiver. You're a liar. Y'all are going to suffer through the pain. You're going to suffer through the pain there. You're going to have to fight the Antichrist. You're going to have to fight with him, and you're going to have to endure to the end. Well, great hope and joy in that. Oh, oh, therefore, encourage one another with these words. You're going to have to endure to the end, and you're all going to suffer and die. Many of you won't, but if you can somehow make it, you're going to... What? There is no rapture. Wait a minute. You Wait. Okay. You're, you're going to suffer to the end until until the end. Guys, you're going to gonna have to suffer. Ain't no rapture. Encourage one another with these words. <laughs> oh, you know, there are some watchmen out there that are so calm and cool and collected, and I wish I could be that way, but that's just not how God wired me. So it is what it is. But look at verse 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, so we're not, we're, we're not, we're not talking. Now, that's a white. You can't get that there. You, you're, you're not talking about the end of the seven. You're talking about before the beginning. Now, when these things begin to happen, what are you supposed to do? Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. I want to read this in the English Standard Version, which in this case, more closely fits the Greek. Okay? The, the Greek word that is used in this instant is uh, an interesting word. It is the word an anakupto. Anakupto. Here's how it says it. Verse 28. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up. And that's the word anakupto, anakupto, and it quite literally means to, it means several things. It means to stop walking bent over, okay? The weight of the world on you, the weight of the times on you, where you just feel like you're weighted down in the spiritual atmosphere. And we, we feel like that, don't we? And we feel like, man, it's just so heavy. It's just so thick. It's just so... It's so hard right now, and I get that comment so often, and, and I say the same thing. It's, it's the most difficult time in ministry for me uh, in my entire ministry because it's so weighted down with spiritual warfare. It's so weighted down. But he says, stop, stop the bent overness. Straighten up. It's not straighten up like you told your kids. Now, look here, Jack. You straighten up. Okay, or you're going to have to uh, go to bed without dessert. You know, act right. It's not that word. It means to raise up your head. So there's your, your uh, New King James Version or your King James Version. Lift up your head. But the EASV says it, straighten up. So stand erect. Stand erect. Stand erect and raise your heads. See, he is your glory and the lifter of your head. Is he not? He is my glory and the lifter of my head. So I am to look up, raise up my head. Look up. Why? Because my redemption is drawing near. Why? You need to be, uh, you need to be prepping. You need to be preparing yourself. You need to be getting ready to fight against the forces of the Antichrist? Well, maybe some of you do need to be doing that, but this is not saying do that. This is saying when you see all this stuff happening, stand and look up. Stand up straight in the weight of the spiritual atmosphere. Stand up straight in Christ Jesus. Stand up straight and look up. Look up. Because what? Your redemption, the, the finality, the conclusion. See, we're, we're redeemed in our spirit. Yes, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, but our emotions, our will, and all of those things are still, they're still in the wrestling match with carnality and our physical body. We have not been transformed. This physical body cannot inherit. This flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Cannot do it. 
Can't do it. We have to be transformed. That's the day of our redemption. So our redemption started on the cross. It was applied to us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We were seated with Christ in heavenly places. Hallelujah. We were given the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we still got some problems, guys. We still have a sin issue that takes place. We still have, we're not in bondage to it, but we still fight that. We still are in the carnality part of it. We're still there. We're to continue to walk in, in Christ and, and, uh, and put that stuff away. Put it off. Put it off continually. That's what's called repentance. Anybody that says you got to stop repenting is just not reading your scripture. Repentance means you keep turning. You stay turned. You walk in that turning. You're turning towards Jesus. You're putting on the new man all the time. Not that you're getting unsaved and resaved. You're just living in that because we're still walking in the muck and the mire and the carnality until the day when this corruption takes on incorruptibility. When this mortal takes on immortality, I show you a mystery, brother. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. It's not the trumpet of Revelation chapter, what is it, chapter 6. It's not the sixth trumpet. the last one for this age. <laughs> That's what it is. The last one for the church age. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Harpazzo. There it is, guys. Rapture. Harpazzo. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Bada bing, bada boom. Therefore, what? Comfort one another with these words. Why? Because we see when all these things begin to happen, and they have... they. They began to happen some time ago, particularly when Israel came back into the land. And they've been happening ever since with ever-increasing variety and intensity. And now in the last two to three to four weeks, it's just off the charts. And we're still, what, uh, five days away from that time of the eclipse? And I don't know what's going to happen that day. Is it going to be the day of the rapture? I, I hope so. But I don't know so. But I am told that when I see all these things happening, to stand up straight in the middle of this spiritually depressing, distressing atmosphere. Stand up straight. Don't walk bent over. Don't live bent over. You know, the only place you should be bowing your head is in prayer. You know, bowing the knee in prayer, bowing before the Lord in prayer, but we should not be bowing to the world under this oppressive atmosphere. Stand up straight, put a smile on your face, wash your face, look up because your redemption is drawing near. What better time to do it when the whole world, at least in America, in the Americas, will be looking up. I want to see my redemption. I'm looking forward to my redemption. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ, the one I serve, the one I follow, the one I'm trying to obey, the one that sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in me. I'm looking forward to seeing him, to see him. And I and you, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. I don't know. If you're not encouraged by this, um, you know, go to the Lord and just ask him. I need encouragement, Lord. Please give me encouragement. But I think you are encouraged. I, th I think the Lord is giving us an infusion of encouragement in these days. However long we have here, however much more distress we see, um, even suffering that may come, uh, I believe this is the year. I believe 2024 is the year. Is it between now and Yom Teruah? Yeah, sometime. I believe so. Could I be wrong? Yeah. Of course it could be. Look up. When you see all these things happening now, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. Okay? Father, help us to stand upright in Christ Jesus. To stand up.
in our faith, to stand up and be encouraged instead of discouraged and to not be in distress, but have the peace of God that passes understanding, to guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus because we have taken all of our cares, our anxieties, and we have taken them to you, all of our supplications, all of our requests. We have brought to you, therefore, we know the peace of God that passes understanding will guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So we stand upright. We stand upright. Knowing that there is an eclipse coming, but there's someone else coming too at some point to take us up into the clouds. So we determine, Lord, we're going to trust you, and we are going to follow you, and we are going to be encouraged as we straighten up and we look up for our redemption is drawing near. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And in these moments, amen, can you say amen? In these moments, may more come to Jesus before trouble really, really hits. I know that's your prayer. I hope that's your work. I hope that's what you're concentrating on, doing what you're supposed to be doing, not giving in to any fear, but doing what you're supposed to be doing until the trumpet sounds, whenever it sounds. And you can't go wrong when you do that. All right? Okay, let's end it here. God bless you all. Stay strong. Stay true. We can do this through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13, always, always, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can suffer. I can be at peace. I can be lacking clothing, lacking food. I can be in trouble or I can be filled with abundance. Either way, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. I love you all. And I hope to see you flying very, very soon. Stand up straight. He's coming.